不是说他两分钟以前在。蒙迪啊，呃，蒙迪啊 ，How about the doctor? Uh, chest cramp. Um, I think that she still. Uh, I I told her that you know if she cannot get in now, you know, as uh this young lady, uh, inform me that uh to wait until it's one o'clock. I mean one minute left, so she can click. On, so probably that she has to do. Is it almost the time? Uh, actually, we have audience with us already, so I guess we can uh, invite Helen Young to start our meeting right now, and we can just keep uh, waiting Mandia while she joins us. I I think that would be okay. Um. Can I have a minute? I I will try to 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 recheck to, with her again. Sure. Okay. okay. Just one more time. Yes. Okay. Um, hello. Can can I ask her? Uh, you know, at the last one minute, uh, how how you do it? You just click. How how do you get in? Actually, uh, in the, right now, the, all the audience can join us, so she can just go to the page, and I guess she have the uh, NGO CSW account, then just have a button like join us and or add right now, then that will be into this meeting. Okay, I she said that she tries to to click that joy us button but still cannot get in Can, can Would you, you, you please uh, repeat again and let uh, Helen to know what the problem? Okay, uh, she said that she tries to click that join us button, but she cannot get in. Uh, did she have uh, just load the Zoom Zoom app? Because uh, even we have the platform, we still need the Zoom app to join the meeting. Uh, she, she has Zoom app as, as well as another lady that's on, on the phone, you know, helping her. Yeah. I, I, I know that there is sometimes a, a little bit late because everyone is joining the meeting at the same time. So maybe she can wait like two or three more minutes. And when the system is stable, then she might able to join us successful. And we right. can just start or wait for like two or three more minutes and check if she can join us. Okay, yes, maybe a couple of minutes, yes? Yes, a couple of yeah. minutes test and then I guess that will be okay. Um, hello. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for the late. Uh, welcome to Pasiwa International's NGO CSW virtual event. I'm Helen Young, the chairperson of Program Development Committee (PDC) of Pasiwa International. Firstly, I would like to thank PDC members from Canada, Fiji, Japan, and Malaysia to join me in organizing 
this event. In addition, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our panelists, President Modia of Pasiwar International, Deputy Mayor of Taipei, Taiwan, Shen Shen Huang, uh, Dr. Ches Karen, UNSCAP Bangkok main representative of Pasiwar International. Pasiwar Taiwan's honorary President Regina Chen, Dr. Susan, Director of Pasiwar International and the President of Pasiwar Hawaii. And the last one is young lady, Shi Yi Yan, Supervisor of the Foundation of Women's Rights Promotion and Development, WRP. Now, I would like to invite Pasiwa International's President Modia to present a brief introduction on Pasiwa International. Full name, mission statement, goals, and vision. Furthermore, when and how Pasiwa International involves in NGO CSW activities. Modia, please. Thank you very much, Helen. Warmest greetings, dear distinguished guests, Pasiva sisters, and valuable attendees. On behalf of Pasiva International, may I welcome every one of you to the virtual forum on feminist leadership led the way to gender equality and inclusive future. Organized by Ms. Helen Young, our program development committee chairperson of Pasiva International. Thank you to all our on, honorable speakers, Ms. Chan Chen Huang, the deputy mayor of Taipei, Madam Regina Chen, honorary president of Pasiva Taiwan, Ms. Chi Ayen, supervisor of Foundation for Women's Rights Foundation Promotion and Development. Dr. Jai Skran Hiran Prit, Pasiva International UNSCAP representative in Bangkok, and Dr. Susan Uamura, President of Pasiva Hawaii. May I take this opportunity to tell you briefly of our association, which surely known as Pasiva, PPSEA WA. So we just call uh, Pasiva. Her full name is the Pan Pacific and Southeast Asia Women's Association. After three years of preparations and meetings, it was officially founded in Hawaii in 1928 by a group of women from all walks of life and from the islands and countries in the Pacific region. After World War II, in 1949, the association was accredited the consultative status at the newborn United Nations. There are now 20 national members in Southeast Asia and the Pacific region, including the United States and Canada. Although Hawaii then a United States Trust Territory joined the United States as the 50th state in 1959, still maintained its independent status as a founder of the organization. This was granted by the international councils. Therefore, all national members will be addressed with name of their country as, for example, Pasiva Taiwan, Pasiva Hawaii, Pasiva USA, or Pasiva Thailand, and so on. All NMOs, that's mean national members organizations, are under one umbrella of Pasiva International. The organization, is a non-profit and non-political involvement. We usually meet every three years, which is called Triennial 
conference at different NMO country. We were in Taipei in 2019 and we did have a great time. Our missions are to strengthen the bonds of peace in the Pacific and Southeast Asia regions for better understanding and friendship among the women and to better the status of women, children in both regions. All Pasiva national members have truthfully followed the objectives and been working to better the status of women and children in various fields as needed in their own countries and communities. Being accredited as consultative status to the Economics and Social Welfare Councils at the UN, PASIWA as NGO has been very active under the policies of the UN. CSWU is one of the main events that PASIWA and NMOs of PASIWA participate actively, both in either organizing events according to the CSWU themes in the circles of this, uh, this SDGs, or being speakers and attending events of their interest. Gender equality is goal number five of the Sustainable Development Goals, which all women are looking forward to have success. Even though in many societies and countries have opened up to gender equality, but globally, those are still very, very small numbers. There are a lot of work to work on, and I do hope all panelists will have good thoughts and points on this subject that you will be discussing to better women's lives in the future. But again, you know, all the men have to open their hearts and mind to let us have that equality as well. Have a very, very fruitful time and Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, President Mudia. Uh, today's virtual events topic is feminist leadership led the way for gender equality and inclusive future. Feminist leadership led the way for gender equality and inclusive future. Why we have select this topic. This is because of the pandemic outbreak. We have realized that feminist leadership is practical and effective way to ensure the protection of women's, women's rights and human rights. This event will highlight that feminist leadership is a spirit for gender equality and will lead to an inclusive future for all. The content includes the action of Asia and Pacific's grassroots on improving women's effective public participation, along with how women have pivoted in response to COVID-19 and bring a better society. Now I would like to invite Deputy Mayor of Taipei, Taiwan, Shen Shan Huang. She is going to share how she has led Taipei City COVID-19 prevention team since early last year.
可以停止，另外一个我关掉，麦克风关掉了。好，我可以，你麦克风没有关掉。可是放影片是哪一台？这边。Sorry, our engineers is now working on the sound. Ellen, Ellen. Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, Jessica has problem getting in. She is sending a video clip. I will send it to you in your email. Okay. Uh, my email. To, to your email, and you, you please give it to to the the lady that help her that you help you. Uh, we can share that later and maybe we can put the video as the last part and we can go to next first. Uh, uh, sorry, everyone. I think we are going to... Uh, uh, is Dr. Chesterian is okay now? Or, uh, or we, in, we, we can, can, uh, can invite our uh, Shi Yin Yan to present first. And when, when uh, uh, the computer is okay, then we will we'll share the video tape. Okay. okay? Sorry for that. Uh, Shi Yi, would, would you please to present, present your, your uh, uh, PPT, uh, PPT presentation? presentation. 
You see the slide? Is that okay? Do you see yes. my slide? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm Sri from Foundation for Women's Rights Promotion and Development. And okay, uh, I'll start my uh, presentation from uh, this photos. As you can see in these uh, photos, uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, Taiwan's effective response and uh, the leadership of our president have drawn much international attention. And you may be curious about uh, what makes it possible for we, uh, for the Taiwan's, Taiwanese society to elect such a leader and exercise the feminist leadership. Actually, it is the result of a collective efforts for uh, in fighting for democracy and gender equality for decades. So in today's presentation, I would like to share two uh, important strategies implemented by the collaboration between the government and the women's organization in Taiwan. And the first one I would like to share that how we promoting uh, women's political participation through setting gender quotas. For example, uh, in 2005, uh, advocating by the women activists, the constitution was amended to uh, regulate that uh, uh, the elected female members in the national wide constituency on each party list should be not less than half of the total number. And after the amendments, as you can see in the slide, uh, not only uh, the women's legislator ratio in the parliament has raised uh, greatly, but uh, women's advocates who concerns about different gender issues like education, environmental protection, and health have more opportunities to be nominated by different political parties. And at, apart from the uh, promoting women's uh, participation uh, in the dem democratic election, uh, we also establish mechanisms to facilitate women's participation in governance institutions. Uh, for example, uh, the com committees of women's rights or gender equality have been set up under premier office and all central ministries. All of these committees are composed of uh, government officials and uh, advocates from women's organization, which means women representatives can participate in the process of uh, policy making and monitor the policy implementation. I would like to, to share a story with you uh, that several months ago when the uh, members of Gender Equality Committee found that President Tice uh, the second term cabinet was gender imbalanced. They urged that uh, the cabinet's uh, gender ratio should uh, reach at least uh, the critical mass or be in line with the CEDAW standard. And later on, the cabinet appointed to be male in, uh, into the vacant positions of uh, minister of Minister of uh, Economic Affairs and the representative to the United States. And as you can see in the slide, uh, Ambassador Xiao and um, Minister Wang, uh, both of them are uh, qualified women with professional expertise. Although there remains not enough women in our cabinet, uh, 
the little progress have been made after the committee search. Okay, and uh, finally, I would like to use the branding banner of the CSW to express our next step. We will take up uh, in uh, to promote women's participation. Uh, this this is because uh, I think we we should uh, promote actively. Uh, the participation of uh, in indigenous women, rural women, elder women, LBT women, as well as women with disabilities. This is because only uh, when women from disadvantaged groups have the equal participation, equal opportunity of participation, uh, the ideal of uh, inclusive future uh, can be realized. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. And I would like to have more discussion with you later. Thank you, Sian. Uh, now I think everyone knows that uh, you have a full picture of uh, how Taiwan women participate in the public affairs. Uh, next one, I would like to invite our uh, Dr. Susan. Uh, Dr. Susan uh, is, is the uh, director of Pachua uh, International and the president of Pachua Hawaii. She is going, uh, she has a very interesting uh, viewpoint on our event. Uh, she told me that uh, 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 she said that uh, uh, feminism has not been traditionally inclusive. In fact, its origins were exclusive. Third and fourth with feminism moved us into a future of inclusively. Uh, we would like to, uh, Susan, to, uh, uh, to explain this to us. Welcome, Susan, please. Susan, did you have me? Dr. Susan? Dr. Susan? Uh, Susan, did you have me? Susan, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you for that first slide. I don't know if, it, if it's legible. Can anybody read that? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, anyway, I'm going to just talk very briefly about some earlier history and end up covering some of what Montia said. But I always found it was very it's interesting to look at the, uh, thank you, at the earlier um some of the early history. So I'm going to start way back in the late 19th century because the first country to um, the first, the, wait, are we okay here? Okay. So the first country to actually give the first self-governing country to allow women to vote was New Zealand. And that was in 1893. And this poster, which I hope you can read because I first saw this when I was traveling in New Zealand and I was in a little town called Waihi, where they had a museum for the gold mine days, which would have been probably late 19th century. And in the ladies room, they had this sign and I found it again. 
on in Wikipedia of all places. And I just think it is, it just absolutely captures what late 19th century, early 20th century, um, what, the, what the, the conversation was that if women, and, and I had to look up the word epicene. I don't think it's one we know all the time. It means with no particular sex at all. So the point of course is that women cannot really be female and vote somehow voting contradicts um, and what you really should do as this poster says, and I don't know if you can read it, but what you really should do if you're a woman is you should go home and look after your children and cook dinner for your husband. And um, they will and they will get the respect of all right-minded people. I'm sorry, this isn't very clear, but anyway, it is exactly what the earliest women's suffragists deal with. And that was that you couldn't even vote and still consider yourself a proper woman. Um, and so that was the, as I say, the late 19th century. By the early 20th century, American women finally got the vote and that was in um, 1920. But one of the points I wanted to make about inclusion is that early on and probably more as a reflection of what the societies were doing rather than the women, voting was exclusive. You had in New Zealand, for example, you had to either be white or European ancestry, or you had to be Maori, which compared to the American experience, including the indigenous people in voting was pretty good. In the US, indigenous people weren't allowed to vote until 1940. Um, so, so when women in the US finally got, were allowed to vote, and Helen, if you could put up the second slide, please. This is Helen. You have a second slide? I think I sent all three. Whoops, nope, that's not me. Nope, I sent It was three separate emails. It was the only way I could do it. Well, anyway. Let me go on. Um, in the United States, we had to have a constitutional amendment, and that was in 1920. And the only women allowed to vote were white women. Nobody else could vote. And even when women could vote, they could not run for office. Um, so one of the things that, that is very familiar to us right now is one of the things that got in the way for the 19th Amendment to be passed was in 1918, there was a pandemic of the flu. And if you can imagine what a pandemic meant in those days, considering how the impact this pandemic has on us, you can imagine that it really did slow down the, the whole movement toward women voting. But there were women who were involved in suffrage in the U.S. who also felt who were also looking for inclusion, and that's the point, of course, of our of our session today. Um, and when the, there were two women who were very very important, and I'll, one of them, I'll I'll tell you about a little bit about both of them. One woman was Crystal Eastman, and the other was Jane Adams. And Crystal Eastman was so fed up with the idea that only white women were allowed to vote that she actually, once the 19th Amendment was passed, she quit that and she would help, was involved in the founding of the American Civil, Civil Liberties Union. So there were women pioneers who were not satisfied with just getting the vote. They wanted to be sure that others were included, that civil liberties were in, enforced in the country. Of course, that's a battle we continue today. Um, and unfortunately, I guess my second slide isn't going to come up. But, and I can just, I can show you this. I can show this on the camera. I, I'm going to try this. Let's see. Um, are you able to see this? This is my slide. Okay, so this is yes. the but anyway, this is the picture, and that's what I want. Just the the symbol of the American trying to get the vote for women in the U.S. The set so 
Carol Eastman went off and helped found the uh, American Civil Liberties Union. The second woman, Jane Adams, I want to spend a little time with because she is one of our Pasiwa founding mothers. And so we need to give her a little more attention. But not only that, Jane Adams was a remarkable woman. First of all, not only was she involved in the suffrage movement and in the founding of the American Civil Liberties Union, even earlier on in 1909, she was involved in the founding of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. In very important civil rights group going way back to the beginning of the 20th century. In 1928, and now I'm catching up with what Montia said, um, Jane Adams came to Honolulu and she gave the opening address. And we were called then the Pan Pacific Women's Conference and became the CEWA, the Pan Pacific Southeast Asia Women's Association. Sometime later, and I don't have a date for that, but I love this quote from what Jane Adams said at our founding. She said, Hawaii, and I hope Hawaii deserves this, but let's see. Hawaii through mutual friendliness of many races, settled problems which are perplexing the rest of the world. You have learned by doing. So we're very nice, kind words from Jane Adams. Um, but Jane Adams, not only did she do everything that I just mentioned, she also, so there she was our, at our founding meeting. I just love this particular point I'm getting to, which is some years, that was 1928. So by 1931, she was so well known internationally, being the first woman to be the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. So I think our origins as Pasiwa are very well represented by the women of the 20th century women. Um, and so eventually we became the Pan Pacific and Southeast Asia Women's Association. The New Zealand and the United States who were, who gave women the vote earlier on than other countries. Not quite as uh, Australia also was just a little bit behind New Zealand. And I'm sorry, I don't have the dates for all the other countries. But I don't know if you can get that last slide. Um, I sent a third slide, actually, I called it four, but if Helen can find that last slide. Um, okay. So I think, all right, the last, the last slide looks like this. And it would probably be hard to read. What I thought was interesting about our founding meeting is what, the, what kind of experts these women were and what they talked about. Um, of course, Jane Adams gave the opening remark. Then Dr. Yoshio from Tokyo Women's Medical College spoke to the medical education for uh, women in Japan. So in 1928, as early as that, um, women were being educated in Japan. And then there's, a, there's some other ones from Australia and China and they're dealing with living wages and things like that. But I think we're having such technical problems. Let me just jump to the point that actually I'm gonna circle back to what Helen said earlier, which is that at the, at these, in these days with the pandemic and every, all the adjustments we have to make, this has been um, a very, very difficult time, especially for feminism and we know women and children are suffering especially. So everything that we've learned, I think, in all of these years and what we have been we as the CEO have cared about and been dedicated to for all these years is very, very much in temporary thing right now. So I'm gonna quit there because I know there's a lot of technical problems. So Helen Yang, go ahead and call the next person. Thank you all for listening. I'm so that. sorry, but uh, uh, I think that uh, we, uh, may, may we have Dr. Uh, Jack Srin is on, on the line? Hello. Uh, Helen, uh, Dr. Yes. Jack cannot get in yet, but she sent the email, uh, send the video clip to your email. Uh -huh. I, I just send it to your email. Could you please pass on to your uh, management, please? Okay. 
uh, I think at this time we, uh, how about we, uh, because the two films has some problems and we'll two minutes to go in. So uh, uh, regarding to any of the questions you want to raise up and we can uh, have a little discuss and I will uh, have the videotape on first. Yes, yeah, so you got it? Yeah. Uh, I, I think it, uh, they, they got the, uh, the, the films will, will not, uh, to me. I, I said, no, I, uh, I sent it to my email. Yes, I, I, I checked my mobile phone, it's on, but uh, okay. they need transfer. Okay. So a little uh, time. So do you think uh, any questions we can raise up and we can discuss now? Any questions you you want to ask? Uh, Mundia, do you uh, do you think that we can have a little uh, discuss uh, uh, how how many CSW NGO CSW event, Pasiwa International National, all together how many? Oh, I. <laughs> I cannot remember, but there are so many, many. And I think you are the one that, uh, you know, one, one of the organizers. Yeah. So maybe and, you uh, can we, tell your experience. Oh. But you have uh, done quite a lot. So uh, the videos can... Uh, we are going to have another uh, event on uh, 24th of March in the uh, evening of Taipei time. Uh, the topic is reviewing social and uh, economic support system for vulnerable women. So I hope that uh, maybe our technical will solve the problem and we have a good presentation to everyone. So Susan, do you have more, more things you want to talk to the uh, audience? And we are waiting for. Uh... Well, I, I saw a question just now. Um, How? I've forgotten who sent it but through the chat about challenges. And I just, yes. I'm trying to think of where, do, when you talk about challenges, where do you start? Because the challenges are enormous, so especially, especially given the situation that we're all living in, that we're. I'm, just, I'm so delighted we're able to communicate with each other and I can see the faces of Hypasiwa sisters, even if we can't all get together. But the, um, the, I, the challenges are just overwhelming and yet we have to get through them. And I think all of the efforts that we've made to reach um, it, well, let me just say a word or two about what's going on here in Hawaii in terms of of our own outreach. We've had a long standing, um, and th because I think the challenges are oh, it the challenges is going to be local. We're going to need to focus on where we are. Do you want me to continue? I Take a day. Okay, well, I was going to say, um, I think if what we can do locally is going to mean uh, <laughs> I think there's too many. Rooms. Okay. 
中医是没一定是没有学到这个。<laughs> Somebody is just uh, thank you, Susan. I, I think that's a, thank you, Susan, very much. I think that uh, the video is, is now okay, and they are going to show the video. Hello everyone. I'm sorry we uh we just uh, figured out the uh, technical issues. So let's welcome the mayor, uh, Miss Huang, and her uh, message will be showing us a video. And please welcome her warm uh, regret uh, warm rating and also the speech. Thank you. Hello to all, and thank you to the Pan Pacific and Southeast Asia Women's Association for inviting me here today to speak. I'm Deputy Mayor Huang of Taipei City, Taiwan, and I'm grateful to be here today to share with you my experience as a local leader. First, I would like to talk about Taipei City's pandemic response and secondly, the trace that enabled me to be an effective female leader. In January 2020, the global pandemic situation rapidly fell apart as a result, Taipei's government began to take pandemic prevention measures and come up with a cohesive government response. Taipei City's Mayor Ke Wenzhe asked me to lead several new and innovative anti-pandemic measures. Taipei City used information technology for quarantine, contact tracing purpose, and to follow up on the public health of our citizens and the residents. When people enter Taiwan, they must quarantine for two weeks. During that time, they are required to report their health to the tracking system twice a day. In addition, we use technology to ensure those in quarantine do not leave their location through their mobile phone. Our city was the first in Taiwan to develop the quarantine hotel system which allows hotels that are managing the drop in tourism to meet the need for place to quarantine. Whenever a case arises, we make it a priority to transparent, striking a balance between privacy, privacy of the individual case while making sure the information regarding locations and context is rapidly available to the public. When a cluster of the cases in neighborhood in Taoyuan appeared, our city officials made the difficult decision to cancel and postpone several lunar New Year's activities. However, we did it with the knowledge that our prim primary goal was to keep the public safe. Taipei cities has thoroughly developed a set of standard operating procedures for pandemic management and prevention. Taiwan is extremely proud of the results that come out of our pandemic prevention programs. It is the responsibility of the government to assess the situation and come up with suitable responses and to protect citizens and allow them to live as normal lives as possible. Taipei City has the biggest mass transit and the bus station in Taiwan. And in 2020, there was no reduction in ridership but because of the pandemic. With the exception of one school, all schools were open and held classes as usual. Workers are able to go to the office normally, 
and apart from March to August of last year, where some public gatherings were cancelled, life has continued. Sports stadium and library remains open, and the city residents continue to exercise and find outlets for entertainment. For example, take our New Year's celebration. Taipei City was one of the few cities in the whole world that was able to have New Year's festivities, and we did it. While taking all possible precautions to ensure the health and the safety of our citizens, through this joint effort between the city government and the citizens, there were no community infection as a result of our New Year celebration. Our standards operating procedures have allowed us to maintain the health of our public with the least amount of interference. In our citizens' daily lives, as the female deputy mayor, my role in the city government is to ensure officials' internal discussion runs smoothly. By acting as a mediator, I promote clear dialogue and communication with the city government. I am very aware of different perspectives and make it a priority for all voices to be heard. We at Taipei City Government also highly value citizens' participation, and as a result, I am able to better express a sense of care and warmth through my public-facing rules. I've had a 27 years career as a lawyer, including six terms as Taipei City Councilor, and having、uh, given over. One hundred thousand legal con consultation through my past experience, I learned that a leader can only provide assistance to those facing hardship and troubles with a calm temperament. When I first started as a Taipei City Deputy Mayor, I only had、uh, six staff members. Now I am able to mobilize. Eighty thousand people to help me achieve Taipei City Government's mission. I have taken great enjoyment in my public affairs work and、uh, possess a deeply rooted sense of a civic duty. I believe the best part about my position is that I can promote the changes I want to see in the city and see my idea comes to life. Thank you again to the Pan Pacific and South East Asian Women's Association for having me today. I am very grateful for the opportunity to share my story as a feminist leader. I wish you all in the future. Thank you. Thank you,、uh, Deputy Mayor. And because of you, we can be very safe and very happy in Taipei. Now I would introduce a lady entrepreneur, Regina Chen, the honorary president of Pasiwa Taiwan. She had managed Taiwan's top ten securities companies, Taiwan International Security Company Limited, for more than twenty years. It it was with a paid in capital of one billion New Taiwan dollars, had. Thirty-one branch offices around the island, and uh, about one thousand and five hundred employees. Starting from July, two thousand thirteen, Regina took the pres presidency position of Pasiwa Taiwan. She has used her business experiences and expertise. To manage NGOs and MPOs, now Regina is going to share her leadership and management history for Pasiwa Taiwan. Regina, please. Helen, are you? Hi, everyone. 
I'm Regina Chen, honorary president of Pashiwa Taiwan. Thank you for the moderator's introduction to me. I believe that feminist leadership is the most powerful and effective way to ensure the protection of women's rights around the world. Hi everyone, I'm Regina Chen, honorary president of Pashiwa Taiwan. Thank you for the moderator's introduction to me. I believe that feminist leadership is the most powerful and effective way to ensure the protection of women's rights around the world. When I was the chairman, of one of Taiwan's top 10 securities companies. The concept of gender equality was the purity for my management. And the initiative female secure member ratio is quite high. In July 2013, when I took the presidency, Preparation of Pashiwa Taiwan. I saw that my business experience and its expertise could be used to manage NGOs and NPOs. Pashiwa International's important mission are promoting peace internationally and improving the social, economic, and the cultural status of women. How could I do to carry out this mission? Therefore, over the past year, I have done my best to present Taiwan's view on women's rights and empowerment for the international community. I hope that through constructive interactions with other countries, we in Taiwan can build a deeper and more solid relationship with women around the world. Let Taiwan share all information and exchange points of view with the global community. Promoting people to people diplomacy. So, international exchange has always been my goal and vision. In 2014, Pashiwa Taiwan launched its flagship website to promote a deeper understanding of our works. In 2016, for the first time, Pashiwa Taiwan organized and sponsored a panel event at NGO CSW 60. And this activity has continued actually to NGO CSW 65 on this year. To increase awareness of the needs of today women and children, Pashiwa Taiwan has regularly hosted advocacy forums on various women issues, such as cyber crime against women and girls, and the differentiation of media power from women's perspective. We have also organized many useful training sessions focusing on issues such as women and, and uh, negotiation, caregiving at families and care centers, and uh, handling 
woman training privates for caretaker and a sick-seeking woman. Moreover, Pashiro Taiwan has a 10 young or short, actually on issue regarding international relations. International NGO advocacy, team building, and leadership training. I mean, to broken young people's interest in international participation. Looking ahead, we will continue our efforts in promoting women's rights and empowerment in Taiwan, as well as strengthening our interaction and exchange with our international partner. Lastly, <laughs> I like to wish you a fruitful and a successful pursuit of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, I think our last uh, uh, panelist, Dr. Cheskarin, she is a Pasiwa International's UN ASCAP Bangkok main representative. And she is going to talk three subjects. The first one, connecting connectivity of Thailand's vast army of village health volunteers and the COVID-19 pandemic guardians. And the second one, the showcase of the video clip of their experiences by WHO officer. The third one is pandemic shift from sufficiency to sustainability as instrumental to inclusiveness through feminist leadership. I don't know why uh, Dr. Uh, Cheskaran cannot join us in the room, but uh, she sent the videotape to us. So we are going to uh, broadcast the video, uh, video tape and you can understand uh, her reports. Video tape, please. I'd like to give the outline of presentation from Feminist Leadership for Gender Equality and Inclusive Future. Firstly, the emergence of feminist leadership from pre-voted in response to COVID-19. Secondly, the showcase of clip video of the Army of Village Health Volunteers. Thirdly, approaches, strategies, mm -hmm and measures of the paradigm shift from sufficiency economy philosophy to sustainability and inclusiveness through feminist leadership. Let me first introduce to you how the feminist leadership become outstanding from this extraordinary pandemic, COVID-19. The intra-action review highlights factors that contributed to successful management of the pandemic in Thailand. Strong leadership informed by the best available scientific evidence. Administrative systems adapted to changing demands. A strong, well-resourced and inclusive medical and public health system. This includes early and effective management of patients in hospital and a strong capacity to test and quarantine contacts. Using rapid response, team and village health volunteer. This is where our feminist leadership built up. Previous experience with major infections, disease, outbreaks, including SARS, even influenza and influenza H1N1. Starting entry screening early led to detection of the first case outside China. This allowed authorities to educate hospital and public health workers and members of the public to the threat. Cultural norms, including non-contact greetings 
and mask wearing, supported by consistent and transparent communication, improve public compliance with protective measures. Early adoption of a whole of society approach included active engagement with academia and the private sector. For our audience to get a clearer picture, let us showcase our scenario through this video clip. Please watch. It's so much easier to fight an epidemic like COVID-19 when you have a strong underlying health system. Thailand has spent 40 years committing itself to and investing in its public health infrastructure. This is really where the rubber hits the road in a pandemic. Thailand has experienced several outbreaks of very large scale, starting from SARS back in 2003. Those taught us lessons, make us prepare for the big pandemic. We started our implementation of the WHO IHR capacity in 2006, 2007, and also improved our public health emergency management. In early March, we start to see a rapid increasing of local transmission. The number of new cases gradually reduced through April and May. This is something that WHO uh, emphasizes to countries again and again. The need to be able to uh, identify cases, isolate and treat them, and quarantine and trace contacts is so important. I think at first, I didn't think But when I knew it was the village health volunteers are ordinary people who devoted themselves to take care of their friends or family within their village. The strength of the village health volunteers has contributed significantly for the Thai government to keep things under control. จะมีเชื้อโรคมั้ยอะไรอย่างงี้ครับผมกักตัวเสร็จแล้วผมก็โทรปรึกษาตลอดปรึกษาหมอตลอดครับผมถ้าว่าอาการอย่างนั้นน
if we use our new conceptual framework, that is the sufficiency economy philosophy, His Majesty the King Pumipon to achieve the goal of 2030 Sustainable Development Goal. Let me first introduce what is the Sufficiency Economy Philosophy, SEP. This is Thailand's gift to the unsustainable world. The Thai model of sufficiency thinking aims to transform the mindset of a whole population to achieve the seemingly impossible, enriching everyone's lives in a truly sustainable way. Innovative management practices developed by King Pumipon Adunliadet of Thailand have been applied across Thailand in agriculture, business, education, government, and community organizations over the past two or more decades. Our world is under pressure with growing inequalities in wealth and access to food and clean water. We depend too uneasily on polluted fools and diminishing natural resources. Traditional cultural practices are being swamped by global popular culture. Concurrently, the pressing impact of the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak globally left the whole humanities with a new awareness that one must be prepared to adopt the new normal lifestyles. This automatically coincides with the paradigm shifts of the sufficiency thinking, moderation, reasonableness, prudent, aiming at the desired ultimate outcomes of immunity, resilience, and moderation, the middle path. The three concepts of the sufficiency economy philosophy is rather a tool to help create sustainability for both human and nature. They are survival, self-reliance, and sustainability. These concepts comply inclusively well with the UN SDG 2030. These are the goals of Sustainable Development Goals. However, the important assumptions that must be borne in mind is that the UN 17 Sustainable Development Goals cannot be achieved without taking into consideration on the goal number five, gender equality. These paradigm shifts of sustainable economy philosophy will respond to the needs of the emerging issues of the new era in pursuing sustainability. It is timely now to spread the deeper understanding of the sufficiency thinking for sustainable development worldwide. In order to establish the continuity and the sustainability of this concept, the Thai government has revealed that the government pushes the role of women proposed to ASEAN to focus on access to capital and digital technology and encouraging women to play a role in public health. For Thailand, the role of women in public health is unique worldwide. There are totally 1,047,264 health volunteers. The females comprise 831,563 persons. Males comprise of 215,701 persons. All in all, women comprises of almost 80% of the total numbers. Watching out for the spread of the COVID-19, the government will continue to expand the network and increase the role of connecting communities to other areas as people who are close and recognized by the people together, such as helping to bring information about the welfare system and basic benefits for children and families, the elderly, the disabled, basic housing welfare, and in medical and health care of volunteering, that is a new model that many countries are interested in. In parallel with the public health work, the Prime Minister also urged the force to push the policy to promote. The collaboration is driven through the Thailand e-commerce project for sustainability consisting the Department of Women's Affairs and the Family Institute Department of Skill Development 
Department of Employment Office Digital Board for Economy and Society Electronic. Transactions Development Agency, it provides knowledge and skills in digital technology, e-commerce, increasing online sales channels, being educated and using media creatively, as well as initiating projects in form of rehabilitation to enhance career after the COVID-19 crisis. To bring local wisdom come together with creativity so that the housewife group can develop new products in which the Department of Women's Welfare will work with the regional university network. This year, Vietnam places great emphasis on fulfilling its commitment to fostering the role of women for a people-centered ASEAN with three proposals. One, promoting women in all three pillars of ASEAN. Two, promote women to maintain stability, securities, and sustainable development. Three, creating an environment and promoting innovation and research potential. From then on, ASEAN leaders made a wide range of views on the enhancement of the role of women. The Thai Prime Minister stated that Thailand appreciates Vietnam for recognizing importance of the role of women and empowering women in the digital age is part of the ASEAN Leadership Conference. In line with the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, in Goal 5, promoting gender equality, empower women and girls, the same has always been the focus of Thai policy, on empowering women. The Thai government has developed a women's development plan under the implementation of the Women Development Strategy 2017 to 2021. The Thai economy promotes women entrepreneurship to the establishment of the ASEAN International Women Entrepreneurs Network or ARVEN and Thailand has served as the president of the ARVEN International for the year 2018 to the year 2020 and will host the 2020 World Women's Leadership Summit under the theme, Power of Women to Change the Economy. In addition, Thailand has enforced the Gender Equality Act 2015 to eliminate gender discrimination both directly and indirectly, together with two important recommendations in the current situation. Number one, promote access to funding sources for the potential of women in business for income and self-reliance. Number two, encourage women to play a role in public health. For example, Thailand has promoted the role of women in village health volunteering, which is the cornerstone of the Thai public health systems. Uh, I would like to apologize. The technical problems that caused our event not very smoothly. And uh, uh, a, I think the time is uh, about uh, to, to up. So I would like to thank you again, our panelists. Apologize for the technical problems and uh, uh, any way, anyhow, uh, thank you for your wonderful speeches. Uh, I saw a lot of uh, messages to our uh, uh, speaker, Susan, uh, and uh, um, our President Modia, and Shi Yi, and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Cheska Ren. So uh, we would like to uh, announce that uh, this is the end of our event and hope to see you maybe next year at, in New York. We have a uh, NGO CSW parallel event in New York and see you in New York. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yes.